The O Cannabis Conference and Expo returns to Toronto June 1st through the 3rd, and there's still some good booth locations available. This exciting event is free for cannabis retailers and will feature Tommy Chong receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award at the O Cannabis Industry Awards. For more information about exhibiting or to register to attend, go to ocannabis.com. That's O C A N N A B I Z.com. It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Weed Maps CEO Chris Beals and also CFO Arden Lee with us. Fellas, thanks for being with us on The Talking Hedge. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the uh, origination story of Weed Maps. Was that written on like on the back of a napkin? Uh, kind of how did that happen? And then walk us through that transition to what you are now. Yeah, so you know, Weed Maps is uh, WM Technology is 14 years old at this point, so a lot older than most people realize. Um, and I think in in the cannabis sector, with you look at the way consumers have evolved, the goods have evolved, markets opening has evolved. You know, I think every every year is like three or seven in, in another industry. So we've been around 14 years. I mean, I think the genesis of the idea was was really this realization that um, you know cannabis really complex product bunch of clinical effects. And the key thing wasn't where are retailers located? It is what are they selling? Who has what in real time? And what what are these brands? What are these products? How can I understand this, you know, really complex thing that I'm going to consume? Uh, and, and so it sounds simple, but I think as you look at our evolutionary trajectory, um, that's evolved to us now having the leading cannabis marketplace worldwide. We're in every jurisdiction that's out there. We're over 700 employees, 45% engineering. Uh, making all the goodness that folks see. And then we've we've augmented that marketplace with a, a suite of SaaS software that uh, better helps retailers or brands use the marketplace. Things like CRM, uh, logistics and delivery, uh, meeting the compliance needs once somebody delivers, uh, e-com uh, embed. So if we're normalizing and making menus transactable and searchable and, and interactable for consumers, Let's power that for the retailer, the brand's own website with e-com embed. So think sort of Shopify for cannabis, but basically everything within that sphere of brands and retailers wanting to reach consumers and drive transactions, we sit at the heart of it. Okay. E-commerce, you guys are down in California. What's, what's your take on the direction that that's going? I've asked a few people the, the same question, and I'm trying to take a poll, I guess, <laughs> about e-commerce and, and the future of retail. So you've got all these MSOs buying properties at, at basically all time highs, com commercial prices and, mm -hmm. you know, stay at home is there. And you've got a lot of defaults, um, malls across America, the Lloyd center in Portland just reverted back to the lender and they're going to redo that. So all in all, what I'm saying is that I'm curious about your opinions about direct sales and the impacts on, um, pot shops. Yeah, look, I mean, the way the regs are structured, cannabis retailers, dispensaries are always going to be at the center of things. There will, uh, every state has a requirement that brands cannot sell direct to consumer and the retail associations have heavy lobbying influence. So I think the the, the a future where sort of brands completely bypass uh, retailers, I think if you look at how long three tiers lasted in the, in the alcohol sector, I believe that that's, that's really here to stay. Now, the, the two big trends, the important things, which I think retailers need to solve for is consumers want delivery. They demand delivery. Uh, and separately, the we're in the first or second inning of just the explosion in the types of products and the number of brands. And the hardest thing right now is for businesses to educate consumers what those things are, but then guide them through the choice. That's really where, at the core of where our Weed Maps marketplace comes in, you know, twice as many people shop by clinical effect as shop by brand right now. Um, and I think that's something that retailers are, are struggling with is you walk in and, and inevitably the bud tender responds to the question, what should I buy with what they would buy? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, look, delivery, e-commerce, that is the future within this sector. Just being able to do it and do it well and cost effectively is the rub. I think the other thing is the number of retail licenses in every jurisdiction goes up and to the right as a factor of time. And uh, you look at three of the new states open, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey. 
Now, for two of those, 50% of all licenses must go to social equity applicants. 30% of them in New Jersey must go to social equity applicants. And so I think the other realization is these markets in terms of retail density are about to expand. And by definition, by requirement, most of those new operators are not going to run a cannabis business before. And they're going to need to learn how to do delivery and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. How has the development of, of compliance evolved? I mean, when you guys started out, it was a completely different industry. It's gone, you know, um, international, global. And so trying mm -hmm. to walk that fine line of, of working in kind of this gray area where there's so many levels or facets of compliance within state regulations, federal regulations, um, and then trying to then add comp the complexity of going public on top of that. There's a lot of compliance. And I don't yeah. think that a lot of folks understand the importance of, of remaining in compliance and having the right people in place. Uh, how important is it to be um, compliant for you guys now that, that you are um, you know, publicly traded? Uh, walk us through that process and, and what that was like to develop that team and how you're remaining compliant. Yeah. Well, so I think there's two halves to that question. One is, is how we think about compliance and maintain compliance. And the other is how we, through the software and the marketplace, help enable or have forcing functions to make sure retailers and brands can stay compliant. Um, you know, in terms of us, look, I'm a, I am ai was a lawyer by training at one point. And, and one of the things that, that was really critical to, to what I was working on was making sure that you would take, you know, every state is effectively like a different country in terms of the diversity of the regs and that sort of thing. And that won't change post-federal legalization. In fact, states are making those regs more complex to thwart any potential for interstate commerce when that day comes. But, you know, and so the big thing for us was building those regs into the software because how you run a marketplace or how a business does delivery varies from every single state, let alone the different countries. Um, but for us, you know, look, we, we, we grew and have developed the leading, what I believe to be leading government relations and policy team. We're actually helping to advise regulators on how to build these markets. But then we're building that with our legal team back into the, the products, into the product life cycle. Mm. Um, you know, and I think, you know, our view has been, my view has been that the scrutiny is always going to be twice as high for a tech company focusing on cannabis as a tech company at large. And so if we're not leading in terms of our, our compliance in terms of how we do things and making sure that we're best in class in that regard, there's just going to be a natural tendency of folks to, to doubt. Um, and so that's really been core to, uh, you know, during my tenure as CEO is really focusing on how do we, how do we make sure we're putting our best foot forward? And then how do we continue to build this legal complexity into the software for our businesses? Because you, you were spot on with what you mentioned. You know, people don't realize that uh, I know you did a segment on Uber. It, it, it is quite literally impossible for Uber to do anything to do with cannabis delivery because of the way the regs work and that sort of thing. And I think most people don't realize the GPS tracking that only employees can do delivery in most states, the trunk limits, the ability to update or the need to update state track and trace systems when you put a product into a delivery vehicle. It, it, you know, uh, cannabis is regulated, I, I think, uh, pretty much on par with uh, radioactive material. Yeah, I worked in banking, and it's kind of funny to see this self-regulatory organization, SRO, uh, in place to uh, write all of the bills and everything for the banking industry, make it complex enough so that senators and house reps don't understand it, but are willing to pass it anyways. And then you just have this SRO manage it for them. And I'm waiting for something like that. I thought the NACB would do that. It's not looking that way at all. But when federal legalization happens, if that's in place, I find that to be um, an interesting aspect. Um, some folks were hoping that a, a recent bill, there was a, a National Defense Something Act bill in uh, NDAA. Yeah. They pulled the safe banking. Uh, I wasn't anticipating for that to, to really hit, but I'm wondering, um, maybe Arden, you can tell me about the impacts as a CFO, what Safe Banking Act would have done and when you guys anticipate it to actually roll out. Yeah, yeah. So for us, um, listen, a couple things. Um, you know, I think there's a, a misperception that a lot of businesses don't have access to banking services today. They do. It's just you have to be a little bit scrappy in terms of finding 
um, folks um, that will bank um, you. And listen, even as a non-plant touching tech services business, we we face we face the same trials and tribulations. Um, so on the margin, uh, some of that gets relieved with safe banking um, getting passed. I think the other uh, thing that's unclear is um, it's not clear to us that just because safe banking passes, then all of a sudden payments become a possibility because there's a lot of intricacies around thinking about major card networks and how payments travel across um, those uh, major card networks and um, safe banking. Unclear to us that that payments become a possibility. Um, now, as we think yet about our business, uh, like I mentioned, we have access to banking. Um, we uh, uh, are listed um, publicly on, on a U.S. exchange, uh, obviously. And, and so we have access to kind of traditional capital. Uh, plant touching businesses have access to banking as well. Uh, what gets easier in some respects is probably the consumer aspects of um, of uh, receiving payment and the like, but it's unclear that it unlocks what's called payment monetization opportunities for businesses like ourselves, because right now we do not monetize payments. Um, we're uh, expecting that to be unlocked more with um, what's called a federal type event, if you will. Um, and Chris you may have a better, more recent perspective than me around the actual timing of state banking, if you will. Yeah, there's a, a recent um, article actually about a credit union giving a 12 year loan at four and three quarters percent. So a credit union, I mean, I have a credit union. I also have a bank, one of the largest banks in, in the country. Um, and they haven't uh, found, I mean, I'm open with what I do, but I'm not big enough to be on their radar. I'm curious if, um, is, is there too big? And then you fail in the banking industry. I mean, you guys aren't obviously don't have any issues yet. Chris, what, what, what's your opinion on, on banking? Yeah, look, I think banking is banking is fundamentally different for non-touch the plant ancillary businesses than actual touch the plant businesses. And so, uh, you know, but it does, it does tie for those ancillary businesses, you know, how they think about, you know, KYC and uh, compliance and things like that. But, you know, look, I think that the crux of the matter is really for the, the touch the plant businesses, which, um, and it manifests in a bunch of obvious and non-obvious ways. You know, you have, uh, you know, be, being able to access a credit union and ACH and debit is great, except for when you're trying to do online transactions, because, you, you, you know, it's hard to do pen transactions in a digital context, or when you have handheld readers and you have delivery drivers going out. But I think it manifests more broadly when you see it's, generally difficult for cannabis businesses to access debt, I would say broadly, you know, maybe there's exceptions here and there, um, unless they're just showing, you know, absolutely stellar kind of cash flow metrics. And then, you know, lenders are generally charging outsized rates and sort of, you know, taking very conservative approaches to how they think about sort of the borrowing base and that sort of thing. So, um, and look, that's leaving aside credit cards, which is a whole different thing. I mean, there's the card care, there's the, the card providers, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, who have a very specific say and sort of conservative, I think, view of their ability to allow cannabis transactions to go through that rails. And a lot of sort of financial transactions in the digital delivery age rely on credit cards. I think as the industry gets um, more normalized, it's, it's maturing, uh, and there's going to be added scrutiny to any business, and, and you guys weren't exempt from that. So I got to ask the hard question about the uh, scrutiny that you guys receive for the perceived delay in removing some of the California stores. Why was that? Uh, why did that make news? Because California was still kind of going through some their own motions. And it would seem logical that some businesses would wait until all everything was ironed out before making any decisions. Uh, and so you guys received uh, some, some scrutiny on delaying uh, the removal of gray slash illicit stores. Can you walk us through that whole scenario that happened? I think that was like two years ago already. I think longer, maybe three. Um, time flies during COVID, yeah. but um yeah, no, look, I think uh, there are a couple of things that happen. I think most people, when, when California passed Prop 64, which legalized adult use, um, there's actually a sunset period where Prop 215 medical cooperatives were allowed to continue for, for just over a year. Um, and so a lot of people misunderstood that point, uh, including Prop 64 licensed retailers who thought they were going to get sort of this 
this immediate sort of oligopoly or monopoly in certain certain markets. Um, and then separately, I think uh, in terms of what we've done, this wasn't the first time we'd seen a market kind of leave, uh, move to adult use and leave people out in the cold. In fact, this has happened in Washington and other places in the past, and we dealt with this before. Um, but in the California case, I think it was really unusual in that, uh, you know, everyone expected, given sort of the overwhelming support for Prop 64, that most local governments were going to allow cannabis businesses. And what we saw post Prop 64 was only 15% of local jurisdictions actually allowed cannabis licensing. And so you're left with just this vast swath of California or many swaths of California that simply had no Prop 64 legal cannabis access. And I think the state was scrambling to figure that out. Local governments who had license were scrambling to figure that out. Um, and separately, you know, we were also trying to figure out, well, how can we match who's licensed under Prop 64 versus who's sunset, who's in the, the grandfathering period with Prop 215. And so we were sort of working through that. But I think, you know, frankly, part of the reason for, for the outcry was that some of the folks who were licensed under Prop 64 really, and this is a testament to, I think, the central positioning and how critical the Weed Maps marketplace is, you know, basically wanted to appear more prominently on the site and wanted to sort of get the windfall of this sort of, uh, structural shift in, in, in the legal landscape in California. But, you know, we rolled out a uniform policy where you have to go through what we call enhanced verification that's been rolled out for several years now. And so, uh, you know, at this point, it's, it's kind of ancient history, but it's, I think it's an interesting window into that post-legalization period. Walk me through some interesting markets. You, uh, Chris, you mentioned uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York. Um, your 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 revenue model um where what's your highest r return where are you seeing the, the biggest impact in, in the bottom line is it regional um is it based on country uh and then maybe within that explanation you can tell me about some markets you're you're excited about yeah look so so th th we run um you know as i mentioned earlier the leading marketplace for cannabis and so Generally, that marketplace performs best and, 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 and um, is the most useful in states that have functioning legal markets. So I would say thematically, if you look at a state like New York right now, where there's 25 medical shops, 95% of cannabis demand by some estimate is met on the illicit market, there's not a lot of need for a legal cannabis marketplace in that jurisdiction because generally there's only one cannabis business anywhere close to you. And separately, most actual cannabis consumers aren't shopping in that medical market. Um, and so for us, uh, the thing that's really interesting about our revenue and, and that sort of thing is given what Arda mentioned, that we can't charge transaction fees and have take rates and whatever. What we do have is businesses competing with each other to try and grab more consumers in that marketplace to buy goods from them. And so that leads to sort of our core metric being return on return on ad spend, the ROAS. Um, and we're driving, uh, I, I would say, essentially it's, it's insane sort of ROAS in most jurisdictions. We're averaging sort of an eight to 10x ROAS. So for every $1 that goes into sort of appearing more prominently on the marketplace, eight to $10 are coming out the other side. Um, but generally the, the markets where, the, where um, we're seeing the most growth and sort of the most traction are where the legal market share is growing the most quickly. Um, and so, you know, you look at places like uh, Michigan, California, as licensing comes on, you're seeing those rapidly start to grow. You see places like Oregon, where they're in, they've increased retail density and, and sort of they're more successfully tamping down the illicit market, really outperforming. Conversely, you look at a market like Illinois, where they have an outsized illicit market. Most people estimate over 80% of consumer demand still met on the illicit side. Mm. And again, there's the broader question of how do we get that 80% of demand into the legal market where then they'll want to use, use the weed maps marketplace. Mm. Um, so the markets that are, I mean, exciting for me is look, I think it's really what states are either opening and opening in a way where they're going to have a functioning legal market, or what are the states that maybe currently have some work to do, but are making the necessary changes to, to get a functioning illicit market going. And so I think um, there's a, a number of new licenses on the horizon in places like Illinois, uh, Massachusetts, California. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, interesting in kind of that latter category. And in the former category, markets that are opening up and opening up robustly, 
uh, I think there's a lot of excitement around New York and New Jersey, uh, where uh, in New York, for instance, about half of all cities opted in to have cannabis retail or didn't opt out of having it. And so I think we'll see really nice retail density, which is the the, the thing that is most correlated with having a functioning legal market is do you have enough retailers? Um, and then you look at a place like Connecticut, I think it could be a really great state, but they're taking a, uh, an overly conservative approach to licensing with, I think, issuing something like only 12 new licenses as they move to, to recreational adult use. Yeah, that's too bad. Some of those limited license states are going to be, um, it's, that's going to be an unfortunate situation, but um... I don't know. At least it's not as bad as Ohio's first run when they only had five. You know, I think Nick Lachey yeah. of ninety-eight yeah. or whatever was <laughs> he's going to sing his sing his way to the bank. Um, oh, yeah, I remember that. Arden got a question about. Uh, there's a lot of competition out there. Um, you guys definitely aren't the only platform out there. Maybe you can, um, uh, Chris. You can you can explain what makes you guys different, I guess. But Arden, I got a question about when you guys are in the act of looking at mergers and acquisitions, um, have you made M&A transactions already? And uh, regardless if you have or haven't, what is it that you're looking at um, when you did or when you will make that M&A? Is there a particular metric that you look at or do you put together like a football field analysis chart and have half a dozen metrics and pick between, you know, public comps that are fairly, would be easy to use if they're available. Not a lot of companies are publicly traded. So, you know, price to earnings, earnings per share is not that available. Uh, and then okay. if you do get a company that that agrees, uh, you can look at their EBITDA. I'm wondering if maybe that's yeah. the, the, the metric to use. Talk to me a little bit about your M&A and how you make those decisions. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that, Josh. So, um, to, your, to one of your questions, yeah, we actually have executed on M&A um, since we actually closed our uh, transaction and became publicly listed on the NASDAQ. We've closed uh, a couple of acquisitions. Uh, so we bought a CRM solutions provider called Sprout in Q3 of last year. We also acquired two capabilities, um, one called Canvea, which is a premium delivery uh, logistics compliance software solution, as well as another uh, capability called Can Current. Uh, think about that as a little bit of an integrations as a service type platform, uh, connecting different single point solutions based on an operator's workflows. Uh, and and so we're really excited about those those acquisitions. They're on the software side. Uh, they add uh, more tools to the toolkit, if you will, within our WM business offering. And uh, we're, uh, as you might imagine, deep in the kind of integration process uh, as we look to kind of scale those uh, those capabilities across our client base. Um, to your question, though, around how we go about analyzing um, what's a good deal for us, um, first and foremost, from a strategic perspective, we think about the strategic fit, right? And so for us, um, as we've considered M&A in the past, we've typically shied away from transactions that are about, let's call, let's call it market share. Uh, uh, we believe that we can uh, more effectively from a cost of capital perspective, organically grow market share versus acquiring market share. Where we've tended to gravitate towards is um, solutions that uh, fill capabilities gaps. Uh, so to the extent we have something that we believe is very strategic, uh, that is a client need or a user need, that we've identified and slotted into our product roadmap, if we can find capabilities, and I'd put uh, the acquisitions that we completed in Q3 uh, right down the fairway in terms of this bucket, if we can find capabilities where something that we wouldn't have achieved until let's call it year three or year four, we can pull that forward uh, and we can make, uh, let's call it the cost of capital work to our advantage. We'll do that all day long. The, the acquisitions that we completed in Q3, they tended to be more bolt-on in nature what we loved about those businesses were um, you had a couple set, sets of founders that were incredibly entrepreneurial, very scrappy. Uh, they had established product market fit across most of the regions that we monetized, but had not yet scaled the footprint of their businesses. And therein lies the synergy uh, in terms of what we bring to the table. We have uh, just under 4,500 uh, paying clients that we can cross sell to, right? And so um, in terms of actual analysis, um, yeah, Josh, we, we look at a number of different metrics. So we look at uh, multiples uh, based on standalone uh, uh, revenue and, and EBITDA to the extent that um, there are EBITDA associated with uh, businesses that we're looking at. Uh, we also look at um, 
the standalone plan and DCF analyses associated with the, the standalone plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, but critically, we look at um, to where I started the conversation, the strategic fit. What are um, the synergies that we bring to bear? And the synergies for us tend to be less about ripping out costs. They tend to be more about, hey, well, how does this fit within our portfolio? How does this add value to our clients? Where do we see this being accretive to growth? And we try to triangulate uh, against all those different metrics in a way that makes sense uh, logically for us. To your question around peers, peers are always hard uh, to to come by, uh, but we try to comp some of these transactions or opportunities against peers just to get a sanity check. And we also look at our own uh, trading multiple and make sure that we're doing a deal that um, financially is going to be accretive for us and also is going to be accretive from a growth perspective. Are some of those deals, um, God, I don't want to say legit, but it seems like there some of them haven't been an arm's length deal. And valuations at $420 million immediately like raise a red flag just, just because it seems arbitrary. Uh, are some of these valuations sustainable? Uh, I mean, we're seeing the cost of capital come way down. You know, I, I've mentioned on a, on a podcast before, Arden, me and you were talking uh, before we started recording about uh, an opinion that I have in terms of where the market's at, that it's kind of maturing, but investors are going to just take whatever they can get. Um, and so a lot of the debt transactions we're seeing is a normalization to the market, yet it's also FOMO and that people are just going to take whatever they're offered. But a 12-year deal at four and three quarters is, is really, really low cost of capital. Um, are you going to be taking advantage of the market as it is and continuing with the accretive deals? And, and I'm curious, is it is it the founders and the product market fit and... And what else? What else makes it a creative deal? Yeah, so there is, um, like I said, it, it all starts with business logic, right? And so if if it makes sense, and like I said, we we um, we have a view that uh, we can in regions where we're underpenetrated get to levels of let's call it um, uh, higher levels of penetration and more uh, kind of. Um, uh, uh, dominance, if you will, in certain in certain regions, similar to kind of our more mature regions where we have high levels of penetration. So that's a playbook that we see pretty consistently across a number of regions. And so we don't worry so much about, um, as I mentioned before, uh, trying to kind of pull forward um, share penetration through through acquisitions. And so it's, a, it's, it's really a question of, um, do we find something that's a capability? And this can be even, even within the cannabis tech ecosystem, it can be outside of uh, cannabis tech. Uh, we've looked um, at, at some solutions uh, outside of um, kind of the tech ecosystem that can be ported in, right? Um, but for us, it, it boils down to if there are solutions out there that, again, uh, pull forward uh, growth opportunities for us that are less about uh, uh, acquiring share, but more about acquiring capabilities that we can then cross sell. Um, to the question, though, about what makes a financially creative transaction for us is it, we have to be convinced at the end of the day that it's going to drive growth above and beyond our own standalone plan. So we start there from a financial criteria perspective. Then it becomes a question of, okay, are we generating that growth in a way uh, that's disciplined uh, from a cost of capital or valuation perspective? And that's where we get into the, hey, well, what is it that we're um, acquiring vis-a-vis comps that are out there, vis-a-vis the value on a DCF basis of what we're buying, vis-a-vis also our own trading multiple and we're we're currently valued. And so we triangulate across all those different factors and then we can't ignore the synergies. And again, synergies, there's always a little bit of uh, an execution uh, risk factor that you have to incorporate when valuing the synergies. And so we like to, when we're looking at different transactions, first say, is, is there a fit there? Um, are we going to do a disciplined deal just independently as if we were almost like a financial investor versus a strategic investor, because the synergies then are a little bit of the kind of gravy on top that adds to the kind of compellingness of the deal, if, the, if that all makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, driving growth, I would imagine that was kind of a main driver for the, the SPAC or the, the IPO. Um, maybe we, maybe you can walk through that. So you, I, you, you initially came in via a SPAC, is that correct? And then you were spun off on NASDAQ under ticker symbol MAPS. Is that right, Chris? 
Yeah, so we we went we went public via via SPAC merger. Uh, we could have probably or we could have definitely done a regular way IPO, but structurally there were some good reasons why the SPAC route made more sense it. for us. Yeah. yeah, no, and and uh, and then yeah, we trade on Nasdaq under MAPS. Um, look, I think two parts to your question. One is why go public? Um, given the fact that you know we're a rapidly growing and profitable tech company um you know look i think our view is is that we're seeing a number of new markets open and separately that we're seeing a, a ever expanding number of needs for brands and retailers that we can attack with uh, new offerings in the marketplace and the saas stack so part of the reason for going public was to have extra dry powder to organically expand potentially do acquisitions um but make sure that we we're always one step ahead of new markets as they opened up the other reason is, you know, just generally there, we are, we are sort of, I, I think the, the marquee uh, cannabis name that's been able to go out on NASDAQ. We're also, in my view, the best way to sort of just broadly play the sector because we're ubiquitous. We're everywhere. We play in different parts of the supply chain. And at the end of the day, we move ones and zeros, not physical goods. Um, and so, you know, that was really in, in terms of the go public piece, it was a, a elevated platform for visibility and obviously gave us access to, uh, you know, a publicly traded currency. In terms of why the SPAC route, I think there are a couple reasons where SPACs make a lot of sense. And in our case, I think one of the issues is the SPAC path generally allows a longer time to engage with investors. And when we went out and we're thinking about what path to take and sort of test the waters meetings, uh, one of the things we found is a lot of the institutional kind of tech and growth stock focus groups that we talked to didn't understand the cannabis sector. They didn't understand the supply chain. They didn't understand the complexity of the regs. And so when you think about a traditional IPO roadshow, trying to get them up to speed on the macro of how the cannabis sector works and then a leading marketplace and sort of suite of SaaS software is a lot to do in a small period. And with the SPAC process, what you can do between the, the pipe fundraising process is you can have a lengthened time to go educate consumers, cultivate sort of a strong group of investors to come into the name. Uh, and so that was ultimately why we chose that route. And one of the things that was great about the SPAC partner we found is some of the founders had been uh, investors and founders and other cannabis companies. So they fundamentally understood the strategy, the sector, that sort of thing. So, so that part was completely covered. Um, and so ultimately that was why we went down that SPAC route and obviously now we're out on NASDAQ. Um. I want to I want to stay on that that same topic and ask about um, Arden, your opinion on on SPACs and cannabis right now. Some of the some of the news and and returns from the initial spinoff haven't been great. Um, uh, uh, Glasshouse brands dropped uh, significantly over sixty percent. I forget exactly how much. It was probably like seventy eight. Some of them dropped like ninety percent. Why, in your opinion, personally, professionally, um, do you get this speculation in the beginning and then this massive correction or retracement after the spinoff? Yeah, I think um, there's a few factors at play, some of which are um, broader kind of macro and kind of market oriented. And, and then, of course, every situation is company specific, right? No. And so um, a few things but, but that I'd say- it, Sorry uh, to interrupt, but it does seem to hit the entire SPAC cannabis space consistently. For sure. For some reason. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And listen, we feel that um, uh, ourselves, uh, right? right? Um, you look at cannabis in terms of from an asset class perspective, regardless of whether you have um, LPs listed up in, uh, on the NASDAQ or the TSX, whether you have uh, uh, plant touching businesses listed on the CSE, whether you have uh, tech platforms like ourselves uh, listed on the NASDAQ, um, you know, this class of stocks tends to kind of um, trade in sympathy with each other mm -hmm. uh, versus against the fundamentals of the types of businesses that we are, right? So I'd start there. Um, a couple things, which is, uh, Putting aside cannabis for a sec, um, you know, these, the, the, the SPAC um, or DSPAC asset class, it's gone through, as you might imagine, um, a bit of an evolution, right? And so when we were um, considering, as Chris mentioned, the different paths uh, to go public, um, we felt and we still feel 
uh, that the DSPAC route was the right route for us, uh, just given um, some of the investor dynamics and the ability to spend a, a lot of time uh, with our top holders con who continue to be top holders uh, of us today in terms of educating them about our story, the opportunity, our end markets, and so on and so forth. Um, but what I'd say is um, the 2021 class of DSPACs, um, there have been, um, and I wouldn't necessarily um, uh, think about cannabis DSPACs within this class, but broader in, in the broader DSPAC uh, kind of category, there have been a few spectacular blowups. Um, you look at some of the companies uh, that have been going public on whether it's the battery side, the EV side, the space side, or what have you. Um, you know, you have companies that uh, have put out projections where you know out of the box first quarter that they were publicly reporting post uh, closing of the DSPAC, they're resetting uh, projections by by not like you know ten percent, but by you know. 10, you know, multiples of, of, of 10%, right? And um, we saw that uh, in the first half of 2021. I think that spooked a lot of investors um, that had, uh, you know, uh, 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 allocated towards DSPACs as an asset class. And so you saw an investor rotation away from DSPACs. Um, and that's been further compounded by what's happening uh, kind of more recently in terms of rotations away from high growth, Mid cap names. A lot of these these backs tend to be small or mid cap in nature, uh, with uh, all the uh, fears around uh, growth and inflation and the like. And so I think there's certainly an element of babies start out with the bathwater as it relates to kind of um, these backs as a whole, as well as some of the cannabis uh, these backs in particular. Uh, and then apart from that, it becomes a question of uh, are are some of these companies um, should they be public? Full stop. Right. Uh, you know, DSPACs traditionally had been viewed as, hey, well, that's the way to go public if a traditional IPO is not a viable route. What we saw in 2020 uh, was institutional investors, their mindset completely changed, um, or at least that's what we were hearing and seeing with our own transaction where uh, DSPAC as a route of going public was just as uh, kind of accepted uh, as a traditional IPO. Um, but that being said, you know, DSPACs are still leveraged by companies that frankly probably shouldn't be public. So. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that one. What is your opinion? Do you guys have an opinion on when cannabis stocks will stop becoming these MOMO or momentum flowing with the federal legalization news that we saw with, you know, when the Biden administration got elected in November and then finally in late January or February, um, that 60% retracement. When will MAPS and cannabis stocks in general be decoupled from this, uh, from the market itself and trade independently? Is that going to require federal legalization? Do you guys have an opinion on that? Well, yeah, I think there's, for us, it's interesting because look, as a, as a marketplace and, and, and SaaS company, we exhibit the one thing that most companies in that class exhibit, which is a counter cyclicality or sort of cushion against broader macro movements. When you look at our revenue growth, you think about past supply disruptions over a year, we've had a lot of steadiness despite sort of the how the end cannabis market moves up and down. And so I think in that regard, we're a bit fortunate in that we're, I think, shielded from, from some of that, that up and down that you see in the end market, but then also in how the, the stocks trade within that sector in the sector. But you know, I think I think one of the issues on the federal legalization side and what will help, I, I think, sort of clean that up is I think uh, companies within the space better articulating sort of how federal legalization will impact their business on the go forward. Cause I still think there's a lot of investor confusion around that. Um, and I think the other thing is, is, um, is better predictive, a better predictive look at when federal legalization will come. I think I've been pretty consistent in saying that federal legalization is still in my view, uh, at least another four or five years away. And I think what we've seen is people say, no, it'll be this year. And then when it doesn't happen, they say, well, I always said it was going to be longer. And I think people need to have a bit more fidelity. And I think sometimes when you see the news segments talking about federal legalization for cannabis, they often end up asking the lobbyists who are advocating for federal cannabis bills. Uh, and they wouldn't be a, a, a very good lobbyist or very good at fundraising if they said, yeah, there's no chance of that passing this year. And so I think that's a little bit of, of what's happening. I, you know, the only thing I'd add to that, uh, to what Chris said too, is um, 
Josh, I, you know, we fundamentally have a view that over time, um, the NASDAQ listed um, companies around that are loosely associated, um, either um, directly involved or kind of around the cannabis space will um, season based on fundamentals um, versus some of the kind of more, uh, well, less um, kind of institutionally um, deep um, exchanges. And the reason for that is fundamentally, uh, whether it's a NASDAQ listed or a TSX listed um, company, it's it's different access in terms of institutional institutional capital um, to a certain extent, less retail heavy, um, less hedge fund heavy, et cetera. And I think some of those more um, kind of uh, technical dynamics in terms of composition of shareholder base also are relevant in terms of like how reactionary uh, some of these stocks uh, are in in the face of uh, whether it's federal headlines or other kind of news events. So, I thought fundamentals were dead. Interesting. So let's uh, <laughs> let's talk about that then. Um, can we speculate on what the elimination of 280E's impact would be on MAP stock price without giving your compliance officer a stroke? Well, I mean, well, you know, uh, we, we sell goods and services to cannabis businesses. Uh, there's general rule of thumb uh, measurements for how much businesses, you know, well-run businesses should be spending on advertising, on marketing, on positioning, on marketplaces, and on software. Uh, I, I think generally, uh, to keep it simple, and, and to your point, keep our compliance officer from having a heart attack, I'd say this, businesses can only spend with us uh, the money that they have available. And that money they have available, that free cash, is 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 strongly negatively impacted by 280E. They effectively overpay on taxes. Uh, and so I think with the passage of 280E, that's a much broader pool of capital that can be spent on this, the critical and essential services that we provide. Um, and, and so you know that that would be my my short answer on it. And, yeah. and just to wrap, just to wrap a little bit of kind of metrics around around what Chris referenced and. We've talked about this publicly in the past. Um, when we've done surveys in the past of uh, our clients, for example, 80% um, of our clients, um, when we ran the survey, and this was um, a little bit dated at this point, so I'm sure this has moved around, um, but 80% of our clients are spending, um, let's call it no more than 6% of their revenue against like marketing services. Um, by the way, half of those, over half of those are spending no more than 3% of, of the revenue against marketing. Now that compares to, when you look at traditional small, medium-sized businesses, they're typically spending close to, let's call it eight to 10%. And enterprise-oriented businesses are spending anywhere from 10 to 15% of their revenue um, in terms of trying to get you know, customers, consumers, users, that kind of thing. And so there is a wide divide between where um, our clients are currently spending versus where they should be spending. And some of that, of course, is structural given to ADE. Mm-hmm. Um, do you guys have an opinion about stock buybacks in the cannabis industry? The, growing up, I always was told that uh, if a company is going to be buying their stock back, then they have nothing else to invest in, especially with a tech company. Normally, an investor is going to put money into a tech company with the expectation of getting uh in technology, you know, technological advancements or whatever. So if a Microsoft uh, were to give dividends or even do stock buybacks in the eighties, they investors would have sold them off in a heartbeat. And yet now it's almost standard. I have my own opinions about them. I don't particularly like them. I feel like it's short-sighted that I don't want to invest in it. I don't want to buy stock. I don't want to give a company money so that they could just buy the stock back. I want them to do something with it. Um, wondering if there's other advantages or you guys have a different point of view. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, Arden, I don't know if you want to take that yeah. one first. I have a few thoughts, yeah. but yeah. So, so listen, yeah. Uh, from a classic cost of capital perspective, you would expect any, um, publicly traded company to go through that hierarchy of, well, what, what is the greatest return? Is it organic investment? Is it inorganic investment to our earlier conversation around uh, strategic M&A? Or is it best you know, return to, to shareholders, whether it be uh, uh, through buybacks, dividends, or the like, right? And for us um, as a technology business, um, without getting into specifics, we fundamentally believe that those organic and inorganic um, opportunities, um, even with where um, our shares may be trading at the moment, uh, yield um, higher returns over time. Um, I think the other dynamic, specifically as it relates to um, companies 
that are publicly listed that are around the cannabis space is a lot of these companies, uh, and we fit that same bucket, um, are relatively new to the capital markets. And being relatively new to the capital markets means um, that your public float vis-a-vis -vis, um, someone that's been public for you know 10 plus years is, is limited, right? And part of um, getting, um, uh, kind of minimizing this dislocation of capital that we're seeing across um, the entire sector is increasing that public float, right? And so that's another piece of it that should factor into the calculus that um, typically doesn't when you think about what the Microsofts or the Apples of the world uh, are thinking about in terms of return of capital, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, do you have anything to follow up on that? Yeah, I was just thinking, I, I mean, I think, look, I think we're, we're entering a period where um, I think we're seeing more rapid expansion of the cannabis sector. I think it's this really exciting period where you're going to see a, a bunch of new markets open, as I mentioned earlier, a bunch of new licenses be issued, a, a bunch of new types of products and form factors. And I would say now is the time to, to I think, be investing. Um, and I, I, I think that's just my natural thought on it is, is and I think it's sort of echoing yours is, you know, there, it, it, this is a time where it feels like there's a lot of uh, areas that are ripe for investment and high ROI for, for businesses that are directly touching the plant or ancillary in the sector. Um, you know, I think the, the other thing is, is, you know, just looking uh, more broadly, I think it's sort of the, the macro landscape. I think there's a emphasis on businesses that are profitable. There's an emphasis on, on, on that side of things. And so I think um, having your own dry powder, uh, you know, being profitable, things like that are important. And so I think uh, being good stewards of capital, in my view, maybe uh, means that, that you know, doing those stock buybacks and things like that just isn't, isn't really looking at the forward landscape in terms of what we see in terms of capital markets. Anything you guys want to say to skeptical investors, you know, looking at uh, maps and um, on the sidelines still? Yeah, I mean, look, I, at a short level, I mean, we're, we're at the strongest position we've ever been in our 14, you know, very long 14 year history. I think when you look at our revenue growth, the fact that we've uh, successfully uh, sustained profitability, uh, when you look at the new markets that are opening up that did not exist before, when you look at uh, such a large amount of future potential revenue locked behind federal legalization and sort of able to come, I think it's an interesting mix in that there's, there's, this is a story that's not on the come. There's really strong performance here and now. There's strong profitability. The stock is at, I, I think, a, a, a really attractive uh, price compared to sort of that performance. But then there's stuff that's sort of on the come in the short, medium, and long term. Uh, obviously, in the longer term, culminating with, I think, federal legalization and I think the broad opportunities that exist beyond that. In the short term, you know, new states really exciting states like New Jersey opening up this year and things like that. In a slightly more medium term, I think we're really just scratching the surface of uh, what we can do for businesses with the data that we have. We have more first party transactional data than anyone else out there. And we're starting to turn that into personalization and recommendations. Um, but then separately, uh, we're starting to uh, provide offerings to brands. And as I mentioned earlier, brands are in the first inning. What data do they use to decide what consumers to target? How do they reach those consumers? For most of those things, as we've surveyed brands, we consistently are finding we're the only ones who are positioned, whether it be because of our marketplace, the data we have, the software that we have inserted into retailers who can solve these problems for retailers. And so I think there's a really exciting uh, brands growth piece of it as well. Um, let's... Let's maybe wrap this up with uh, with some trends. So WM Technology, you guys are being able to see some trends, I would imagine, things that have uh, changed over time, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Um, and I'm, I'm curious what some of those trends are. You know, I think a, a couple things. Um, I think... I think the, the pandemic and the uh, accelerated, I think the, the willingness, albeit it's still a bit depressed, of people to order online and get delivery. I think um, because cannabis is so complex and separately because there are still uh, adverse implications for being a cannabis consumer, whether it be in things like child custody, gun ownership, certain governmental jobs, benefits, that sort of thing. 
people are sometimes reluctant to say, I'm going to upload all of my information to the, to the internet and order cannabis online. And I think we re we're really seeing a rapid kind of shift in mindset where people are saying, okay, this is normal. I can shop online. I can browse. And also there, uh, and I think we're really leading the way on this. There's better information that lets people make these buying decisions on what is for all intents and purposes, a, an over-the-counter complex pharmaceutical product. Um, the other thing I'd say though, is we saw a real growth in, um, in, in I think uh, some kind of some new users coming on during COVID trying to deal with sort of the stress of the situation and that sort of thing. And we saw a rise in, in the edible segment. And I, I think there's a lot of speculation as to why that is, but I think it's interesting watching sort of the growth of, of edibles in terms of a share of basket and transactions we see. Um, there, there's been a trend line there uh, that's upward. The other thing I'd say though is, you know, I, I'm fond of the saying that, that uh, history repeats itself really fast in cannabis. And I think we're seeing some, some, some uh, new trends that are really old trends that I think are, are gonna be interesting to see on the go forward. So I think one of those is um, the concentrate segment has always been a really important segment of the, of the cannabis sector for medicinal users and for sort of um, more regular users. And I think there, there was a growth for a period in the types and diversity of product, diamond, shatter, um, you know, sauces, that sort of thing. And it felt like that kind of slowed and compressed as a lot of places tried to get uh, their head around sort of new legal markets and sort of new testing regs and that sort of thing. And I think now we're seeing sort of a reemergence of this diversity of products in the concentrate area. We're getting this really complex um, expansion of sort of the types of SKUs within the concentrate segment. Uh, and then the last thing I'd say is um, brand, brand, brand. I think one of the hardest things that's been uh, for, for brands has been developing true consumer affinity. Box or packaging recognition, that's one thing, but making having people associate that brand with the origin, it being sun-grown, it being sort of by legacy farmers, it being high quality, suitable for certain indications, has been difficult to establish. And I think um, we're starting to see brands make an increased effort to attack that. But separately, that's happening at the same time as I think we're about to see an explosion in the number of brands over the next couple of years with new states opening and so many of them being manufacturers, cultivators, sort of the precursors of brands. Um, we're, we're really just at the beginning of what's gonna be a, a large increase in the number of brands and the types of unique products. Um, but Arden, I should, I should flip it over to you if you have any. Yeah. I, that I do want to ask you, Art, I want to ask you some stuff, yeah. Arden. Um, yeah. But basically, uh, I talked to George Jage of uh, MJ Unpacked and MJ um, uh, Insights, uh, Brand Insights, and he talked about brands too. Um, I also did an aggregation of a couple hundred predictions, uh, crystal ball predictions for the cannabis industry in 2022. And um, within that, 7.7% said brands or branding would be important. Um, Chris, you said early on that if the, your, your um, people going to weed maps are, are still looking for effects over brands. And I think a lot of people going to the store are still asking highest THC at the lowest price point. But when you look at cookies and what they've done out of California worldwide to create consistency with the cultivars, and no one knows about Burner as a wrapper versus Snoop Dogg, but no one cares about Snoop by Leaf. They want the genetics and the consistency and the experience from the brand of cookies. So I'm curious... Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, branding is going to be important, but there's also, you know, consolidation in m &A. there's pricing, you know, you, you can't be pre money, you know, pre revenue and try to go and look for investors. Now you could do that in 2018. I don't think that's going yeah. to work now. So the investing landscape is changing. Um, I think with delivery, things that we saw in the pandemic with you need delivery in Washington state, we need consumption lounges. It's a class C felony to maintain and operate a marijuana lounge in Washington state, which I've wrote a bill for. So wish me luck. Yeah. Um, banking should be a thing. Small businesses over MSOs might be a thing. What is your crystal ball prediction? I'm just going to share my screen and kind of show you what I'm looking at here. Um, in 2020, 20, in 2022, uh, federal legalization being the number one thing. So 17.3% of the people that um, have been aggregated in here think that federal legalization all the way down to banking at 2% um, mm -hmm. think that that's what's going to happen. So my question to you guys is, what is your crystal bonk prediction for 2022 and beyond? 
And how are you guys going to continue to pivot to stay relevant? Yeah, well, look, I'll, I'll start with the, the headline one you have right there. Um, I, we, we have a, you know, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a large um, and, and very efficacious government relations and policy team and uh, really stay on top of the pulse of what's happening. But, but my firm belief is we will not see any movement on federal decrim, uh, rescheduling, legalization at all this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in terms of uh, consumption lounges, I think really important area that I think we're going to finally start to see some consumption lounges opening in places like West Hollywood and other areas that start to mirror um, what I think are the best examples of social of, so, of, of kind of consumption lounges, which are what you see in Spain, Barcelona, specifically with the, the um, social clubs. Mm -hmm. and I think that's mm -hmm. going to start to change the dialogue about how people think about social spaces for consuming cannabis. And it's not just going to be like the restaurant concepts. It's going to be um, things where people are getting together to socialize, to be with each other. And yes, there is cannabis there. And I think that'll be a really fascinating trend line. Um, I, I think in terms of the investing side, I think, look, um, I think that the, the, the wave of new licenses and the emphasis on concentration caps, you know, in New York, you can only have three retailers per single ownership group, uh, as well as sort of social equity being at front of mind and sort of social equity applicants not being represented uh, by and large in the existing industry is I think you're going to have this wave of new entrants to the space who will not or cannot be ruled up and they will be independent operators. And I think how people... Uh, think about them and how they think about sort of existing names in the space and their ability to pivot and react to that, I think is going to eat a lot of the airspace and a lot of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Separately, I think, um, you know, a lot was made out of the supply disruption that happened late, late this last year. Here's a contrarian view. Uh, look, one of the advantages of having been around for 14 years is we've seen this before. We've mm -hmm. seen many, many, many supply disruptions, supply gluts, product leaking into the illicit market, that sort of thing. And I think one of the things nobody's talking about is many times in the past when we've seen supply oversupply and we've seen supply gluts, we've seen people, the cannabis operators, and this partially ties to a lack of good data, overreact. And, and you, see, you see sort of lack of supply in the period that follows. And so I think it'll be interesting to watch where sort of total supply sits this year. Mm -hmm. And if people, specifically producers, kind of overreact on that side of things. Um, separately for us, um, you know, we're going to be having a big presence this year on the East Coast. We've been laying the groundwork on that for quite some time. Uh, and separately across the marketplace, we're putting a real emphasis on making sure that we have the pathways for consumers to find cannabis, regardless of whether they're strain conscious, effect conscious, price conscious, THC conscious, uh, THC for the price point conscious, you know, that sort of thing. And so there's a lot of Kind of deep data work because I think this will also be the year where the consumer really rears their head and says, I'm not going to buy any product. I want specific products and I want them to specifically meet my needs. And I don't want to, I don't want to have error on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd fall in that category. Arden, what's your crystal ball prediction? Where do you think the industry is going to uh, go? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, listen, I, I, these, these themes uh, under your 2022 predictions, I think. I think all super relevant. I was just, as, as Chris was going through uh, uh, his predictions, uh, you know, what struck me about this list is, and, and I was thinking about our own business is, um, you know, we, we hope all these play out because they, they all represent opportunities for us to a certain extent, right? So to the extent that there's more innovation within uh, the category. Uh, there's new product form factors. There's new uh, brands that continue to resonate with uh, consumers. There's more of a focus on price. Um, that all requires uh, ways to kind of surface information around these things to end users. Uh, and that's essentially kind of um, where we come into play to a certain extent on, on, on our marketplace side. Um, and, you know, if there's one thing that I would pick out here, uh, I, I, you know, my, my crystal ball would be that you're going to see um, uh, a lot more consolidation in M&A across all parts of the supply chain and all parts of the kind of um, services uh, that cater to to cannabis. Uh, we're seeing it with our own business. We talked about uh, publicly previously that um, uh, we had a lot of inbound dialogue. I think rightly or wrongly, there's a perception amongst um, a number of folks, uh, even within the tech ecosystem, that somewhat of an end game uh, may be starting. Um, I don't know if that was prompted by uh, by our listing, some of the other capital raising that's going on, but uh, that breeds opportunity 
uh, for businesses like ourselves that are that are platform in nature. So I'm a big believer in that consolidation of an A thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think companies who aren't prepared for it are going to be caught by surprise. Um, but I think with that, we got to have to roll this one up. But where can people find you guys at? Where is uh, WM Technologies? Uh, other than NASDAQ under the ticker symbol M- MAPS. <laughs> Yeah, MAPS on NASDAQ. No, we're, uh, if you, our marketplace is at weedmaps.com. Uh, and if you look for WM Business, you can find out all, all, all about our, uh, our B2B business in a box suite of solutions for uh, retailers and for brands. Perfect. But I think with that, we're going to have to roll this one up. So I want to thank my guest, Chris Beals, CEO of uh, Weed Maps and also Arden Lee, CFO. Appreciate you guys being on the talking hedge. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. Yeah. This is The Talking Hitch. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. <laughs>